This video lesson will discuss the impeachment trial of President Andrew Johnson. Radicals, meanwhile, had been sharpening their hatchets for President Johnson. Not content with curbing his authority, they decided to remove him altogether by constitutional processes. Under existing law, the president of the Senate, the corrupt and, and rabidly radical Bluff Ben Wade, would then become president. As the initial step, Congress in 1867 passed the Tenure of Office Act. Contrary to precedent, the new law required the president to secure the consent of the Senate before he could remove any appointees once they had been approved by the Senate. One purpose was to freeze into the cabinet the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. Although outwardly loyal, he was secretly serving as a spy and an informer for the radical Republicans. Johnson provided the radicals with a pretext to begin impeachment proceedings when he abruptly dismissed Stanton in 1868. The House of Representatives immediately voted to impeach Johnson for high crimes and misdemeanors, as required by the Constitution, charging him with violations of the Tenure of Office Act. With evidence zeal, the radical-led Senate now sat as a court to try Johnson on the dubious impeachment charges. The House of Representatives conducted the prosecution. The trial aroused intense public interest and thousands of tickets were sold in 1868. Johnson kept his dignity and sobriety and maintained a discreet silence. His attorney argued that the president, convinced that the Tenure of Office Act was unconstitutional, had fired Stanton merely to put a test case before the Supreme Court. House prosecutors had a harsher time building a compelling case for impeachment. On May 16, 1868, the day for the vo first voting in the Senate, the tension was electric. By a margin of only one vote, the radicals failed to muster the two-thirds majority needed for Johnson's removal. Several factors shaped the outcome. People were afraid of, destabilizing, of setting a destabilizing precedent, as well as being opposed to abusing the constitutional mechanism of checks and balances. As the vice president remained vacant under Johnson, his successor would have been radical Republican Ben Wade, the president pro tempore of the Senate. Wade was disliked by men, many members of the business community for his high tariff pro labor views, and he was distrusted by many moderate Republicans. Diehard radicals were infuriated by their failure to muster a two thirds majority for his removal. But the nation accepted the verdict with good temper that did credit to its political maturity. In a less stable republic, it might have been an armed uprising. The nation thus narrowly avoided a dangerous precedent that would have gravely weakened one of the three branches of the federal government, and he was found not guilty. Johnson's administration achieved its most enduring success in foreign relations. The Russians, by 1867, were in a mood to sell the expanse known as Alaska. They had already ex overextended themselves in North America and saw that in another war with Britain they would probably lose their defenseless northern province. Alaska had been ruthlessly furred out and was a growing economic liability. The Russians were therefore eager to unload their frozen asset on the Americans. They preferred the United States to any other purchaser, primarily because they wanted to strengthen further the Republic as a barrier against their enemy, Great Britain. In 1867, Secretary of State William Seward, an ardent expansionist, signed a treaty with Russia that transferred Alaska to the United States for the bargain price of $7.2 million. But Seward's enthusiasm for these frigid wastes were not shared by his countrymen. The American people were still preoccupied with Reconstruction, and they were economy-minded and anti-expansion at the time. They called it Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox. Then why did Congress and the American public sanction the purchase? Russia had been conspicuously friendly to the North during the recent Civil War, and Americans did not feel that they could offend their great and good friend, the Tsar. The territory was also rumored to be teeming with furs, fish, and gold, and could be very profitable. So Congress and the country accepted Alaska, but somewhat derisively, but hopefully. Many white Southerners regarded Reconstruction as a more grievous wound than the war itself. They resented the upending of their social and racial system, political enfranchisement and empowerment of the newly freedmen, 
and the insult of federal intervention in their local affairs. Given the explosiveness of the issues that had caused the war and the bitterness of the fighting, the wonder is that Reconstruction was not far harsher than it was. The Republicans acted from a mixture of idealism and political expediency. They wanted to both protect the freed slaves to promote fortunes of the, Amer of the Republican Party as well. Reconstruction conferred only fleeting benefits on the newly freed men and virtually extinguished the Republican Party in the South for nearly a hundred years. Moderate Republicans never fully appreciated the extensive effort necessary to make the newly freed slaves completely independent citizens, nor the lengths to which Southern whites would go to preserve their system of racial dominance. Deep-seated racism ingrained American resistance to tampering with property rights and rigid loyalty to the principle of local self-government, all combined with a spreading indifference in the North to the plight of the African Americans, formed a formidable obstacle. The more the Old South was in many ways more resurrected than reconstructed. We'll discuss more about the impact of reconstruction on the newly freedmen and the South 